This week on Q&A, our guest is Supreme Court Associate Justice Antonin Scalia. His new book is titled, Reading Law, The Interpretation of Legal Texts. Justice Antonin Scalia, your book, Reading Law, The Interpretation of Legal Texts. Why now? Why now? Mm -hmm. uh, because I finished working on it now. <laughs> what, but why you know, this I, book? Well, and how important is this book? You've done a bunch in the past. Well, I've, I've done a bunch in the past, but th this is the first time I've really tried to pull together all of the, all of the, uh, what you might say, interpretive causes that I consider important. Textualism, originalism, uh, no use of legislative history, and have described, uh, you know, the, the, the opposing uh, theories of, of interpretation. Uh, and uh, most important of all, or maybe most important, but certainly most difficult of all, have gone through the, uh, the steps that a, that a textualist uh, has to take in order to produce a correct uh, reading of the text, namely the so-called canons of interpretation, which are, you know, uh, largely ancient common sense rules of how, how language is used. Who do you expect to read this? I hope judges will read it. I hope lawyers will read it. I hope law students will read it. And I hope legislators will read it because um, uh, it's just as important that legislators know how their language will be interpreted by the courts as it is for the courts to know how they ought to interpret the, the language. So those, those are the four. You, you pointed out to me before we started that I was not a lawyer. Yeah, well, maybe the general public. Should I add the general public? I mean... I don't know. That's what I, this is... Parts of it are understandable to the general public. Parts aren't. Well, it, it would give the general reader uh, a, a window into, uh, into the world of, of, of judges and of how judges go about uh, deciding on the meaning of enacted texts, texts. And, maybe most important of all, on, on what is the true uh, fault line in uh, in judges, uh, distinguishing judges, the fault line is not conservative versus liberal. It's uh, it's rather theories of interpretation, uh, which differ greatly from from one judge to another. Unfortunately, I'm going to read a long paragraph that you wrote. Okay, I will like it <laughs> at the <laughs> at the end of your preface. Yeah, yeah. One final personal note. You oh say. yeah, right. Your judicial author, there's a co-author and you're the judicial author, knows that there are some and fears there might be many opinions that he has joined or written over the past 30 years that contradict what is written here, whether because of the demands of stare decisis or because wisdom has come late. Second part, worse still, your judicial author, that's you, does not swear that the opinions that he joins or writes in the future will comply with what is written here, whether because of stare decisis, because wisdom continues to come late, or because a judge must remain open to persuasion by counsel. And then you finish this by saying, yet the prospect of gotchas for past and future inconsistencies holds no fear. Yeah, I thought that was pretty clever, didn't you? Didn't you? Well, I thought uh, <laughs> there, it, it was food for, for questions. I, I, for I worry about people pointing out, uh, you know, leaping up to say, well, you say thus and so, and in your opinion, you know, 22 years ago, uh, you say, I, I didn't review all of my opinions to be, to be very sure that uh, every one of them uh, comports with, uh, with the truth set forth here. And uh, I didn't want to have to do that. And for the future, uh, you know, any judge has to be open to persuasion, to, uh, to acknowledge uh, his past ignorance if necessary. So, I, you know, I, I won't swear that I'll follow this in the future, but I probably will. Gotchas. 
gotchas? Who, who, who delivers to you gotchas in, in your life? Apart from my wife? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would expect gotchas to come principally from, uh, from academia. Uh, many in academia, probably very many. Most of academia does not agree with the uh, theory of interpretation set forth in this book. Why? Uh, why? Um, because they prefer theories that augment the, the power of the judge and hence the power of the law professor. Um, the, the theory of interpretation set, set forth here is a, is a, very, a very humbling one. It does, it does not leave a whole lot up to the uh, policy discretion of the judge. In fact, it leaves nothing up to his policy discretion. The, the name of the game is, is to give the fairest reading to what the people's representatives have enacted. That's, that's what a judge is supposed to do. Now, that is an uncongenial approach to someone who wants to do good, who wants to use his office as it can be used to do things that he thinks are good for the society. Uh, if, if one has that zeal, uh, one will not like uh, the approach set forth in this book. In the uh, earlier part, which you have labeled under forward, um, uh, you have a sentence here I want to ask you about. Every lawyer, every citizen concerned about how the judiciary can rise above politics and produce a government of laws and not of men should find this book invaluable. You just got, you know this, you just got accused of being political at the end of the term. Was I accused of being political? Yes, sir. I even got the document. I've been out of the again. country, yeah, so right. I, don't, I don't read that stuff. Anymore. What happens to you, though, when you hear somebody say, oh, he's the most political judge ever? You know, I, sometimes I, I, I speak to groups about judging judges. You, you can't judge judges unless you know what they're working with. Simply because you like the outcome of an opinion, you say, oh, that's a good judge, or you dislike it, that's a judge. Unless you want your judges to ignore the text that they're dealing with, and we're always dealing with a text. It's either a regulation or a statute or the Constitution. Unless you want them to ignore the text, it's really unfair to judges to say, I like the result, therefore that's a good judge. I hate the result, therefore that's a bad judge. You have to read the opinion and see the sections of the statute they're dealing with, trying to reconcile and whatnot, and then you can say, the guy did a, a terrible job of, uh, of interpreting this statute. That, that's an intelligent criticism, but not just because, uh, you know, you don't like the way the opinion comes out. And anyway, my opinions don't always come out the same way. I mean, uh, you know, they're not always, quote, conservative, to, to the contrary, sometimes. Uh, in some respects, I, I ought to be the pinup of the uh, of the criminal defense bar because uh, a number of my opinions have uh, have defended the uh, the rights of criminal defendants, even though I'm you know socially I'm I'm a law and order conservative. But that's my job is is not to say how it ought to be, but to say what the Constitution demands. We have a group of teachers here this summer, and I asked them what they would ask you. Uh, and they said they want to know what you would advise teachers, how, what you would advise teachers, how they should teach the Constitution. Well, the, the, these are teachers where? What level? Oh, high they're school? high school. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. I mean, but how, how would you want the Constitution taught in high schools? Well, first of all, I, I am appalled that um, Americans get out of high school, get out of college, even get out of law school without ever having read the Federalist Papers. I mean, thing number one, if, if, if you want to have the proper respect and indeed awe that you ought to have for the United States Constitution, thing number one is to realize how brilliant were the men who, who put that piece of work together. And that shines through in, in the Federalist Papers. I, I, I am always astounded. I, I can ask a group of, of 
law students, how many of you have read the Federalist Papers and you know maybe six percent or something like that, you should not be able to get out of high school without uh, being exposed to what the framers thought they were doing. Should you have to, I mean, is it really something you should read, read in high school, the whole thing? The whole thing, yes. Uh, people read, you know, number 48, the, 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 the famous numbers. But only if you read the whole thing do you realize what a, what a breadth of knowledge these people had. They were not doing it by the seat of the pants. They, uh, they had experience in various systems of government in, in this country and abroad. And uh, uh, from that experience, they, they deduced uh, uh, or they applied what, what James Madison called at the, at the convention. He says, gentlemen, we are engaged in the new science of government. Nobody had ever tried that before. And people ought to appreciate that, that uh, this, this, it had never happened before and it will probably never happen again, that, 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 that a system of government w will be uh, devised uh, by a seminar. I mean, a, you know, a three month long seminar composed of, the, of the, po the political leaders of the entire country. That won't happen again. And you can't appreciate that unless you uh, seep yourself in, in, in the times, including uh, reading the, uh, the Federalist Papers. In this book at the beginning, you list a whole bunch of people that you think. Yeah. Uh, we counted, I Probably think. Probably missed some, too. No, but we counted 23 of your former clerks. Right. I've got, we had a former clerk of yours here uh, several months ago. I want to run this little thing and get your reaction to it. All right. He and I had a very intense argument about some statutory interpretation case. Um, and he took me out and he said, you need to talk to my clerks now. And so I did. Uh, and the clerks were all very conservative clerks and they had marked me as a liberal. And so they were basically, this was just, you know, I was the Christian and this was the Colosseum and uh, the lions were called in. And, um, and so I had to sit there and be beaten up by these conservatives. Um, and then uh, Justice Scalia came and said, I'm going to lunch, I need to talk to you for a minute. So he brought me in and he said, okay, um, so I'm gonna give you the job, but you can't tell my clerks. Um, so I had to go out and I had to not um, fumble for the next two hours before my plane left and I continued the conversation. And then I hear that six months later, the clerks came into him and said, Justice, you need to hire your fourth clerk. And he said, um, I did hire my fourth clerk and they were, outraged that he would have hired um, someone who was not of the party. The true story. Um, if he says so, I, I don't, I don't, uh, uh, it did not make as much an of an impression upon me as it did upon him. I'll put it that way. Well, how many clerks have you had since oh, I've had four times uh, 26 on the Supreme Court and uh, on, on the Court of Appeals, what, uh, five times three, so it's, it's a lot of clerks. But the real issue here, though, is how often have you hired a clerk that doesn't think like you do? Uh, infrequently, but not never. Um, the, the problem is, uh, I, I, don't, I don't care what the policy preferences of the, of the clerk are. In fact, uh, other things being equal, I would prefer a clerk whose instincts, whose policy instincts are the opposite of mine. But <laughs> I find it very hard to find a liberal clerk who is hard-minded and not wishy-washy, who applies rules of law rather than speculating about what the best result would be and so forth and so on. That's, that's not what I do and I don't want my clerks to do that. When I have been able to find a, what should I say, a a flint-minded liberal, uh, as, as in the law clerk you just saw, uh, they have been invaluable because, uh, you know, they come at, the, come at the problem from maybe from the opposite uh, social perspective that I do and uh, they're, they're a check upon what a judge always has to worry most about and that is uh, that, that instead of applying the law, he's He's really just applying his own his own uh, wishes. That's that's bad, bad judging. When I earlier read that line about uh, every lawyer, every citizen concerned about uh, how the judiciary can rise above politics, those are actually the words of Frank Easterbrook. 
And the reason I bring that up is that uh, if you look at Frank Easterbrook's brother is Greg Easterbrook, who we see right. dealing with ecology. Why is he your forward writer, and how long have you known him? Oh, I've known Frank a, a long time. Uh, we were colleagues on the faculty at the University of Chicago in the in the what in the eighties. Uh, he went on to be a judge on the Seventh Circuit, uh, chief judge uh, of the Seventh Circuit, ultimately. And uh, he he wrote the forward because if if there is is one other name, one other judicial name associated with the, the, the two principal uh, theories of this book, textualism and originalism, it is Frank Easterbrook. He is, and, you know, and if, if, if I had to pick somebody to replace me on the Supreme Court, it would be Frank. He and I tend to see, uh, see things uh, the same because we're both applying the same principles of textualism and originalism. Political scientists, he writes this, political scientists, editorial page writers, and cynics often depict judges as doing nothing other than writing their preferences into law. Yeah. Do you agree with that? Oh, I, that's certainly, certainly true. Political scientists, editorial page writers. What do you think of editorial page writers? You read them? To understand all is to forgive all. I, they have to sell newspapers. They tend to judge judges incorrectly, as I told you earlier. I doubt whether they read the opinion carefully and see what sections of the statute are involved. They, they have a gut reaction. This is a terrible result. Well, sometimes it's a terrible result because that's, that's the terrible statute that Congress wrote. And the rule, uh, you know, the rule for a judge ought to be garbage in, garbage out if you're dealing with a inane statute, you, you, ought, you are duty-bound to produce an inane result. So a lot of those editorials are just knee-jerk um, uh, opposition to, to the consequence, not, not a, a, a dispassionate, intelligent assessment of the process of interpretation that the judge went through. One of the prior justices of the Supreme Court. Well, I, listen, I have to add, too, that if an editorial writer or even, even a, uh, an article writer did what I've just recommended, went through and described to the reading public, oh, uh, the case consisted of this section, 323B, little i, and it had to be reconciled with 523, blah, 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 you know, if he went through that, he would lose his readership in no time. So I am not at all surprised that uh, that the newspapers uh, tend to um, evaluate a case simply on the basis of whether the result seems like a good result or not. That's, that's really all the reader is interested in. The reader is not interested in the rest of that stuff. Well, then let me ask you about something that uh, along those lines, uh, you know, we prepared for your this interview. Your people at the publishing house told us there were all kinds of rules that we things we couldn't ask you about you can ask me anything at all i, I, I just i won't answer a lot of stuff oh i know but one of the things we four years ago when we did an yeah. interview we talked about uh, bush v gore right and i know you don't want to talk about that again but let me just show you of some video from an interview you did with piers morgan when he asked you i mean he asked you everything that we're not supposed to ask you and you answered everything that we're not supposed to ask you. did i do that yes you did uh, that i want to show you this clip oh, well ask me again yeah, now, <laughs> here's this let me just show you this <laughs> right, what has been in your view the most contentious what's the one that most people ask you about contentious well, I guess the one that uh, you know created uh, most uh, most uh, waves of uh, disagreement was Bush versus Gore. Mm. Okay, that comes up all the time, and my usual response is, "Get over it." Why is it? You went on to explain further on yeah. on that, and, right. and we did it four years ago. Did Actually, they the tell same you thing. you couldn't ask about? I didn't know that that was yeah. the guideline. But well, we're used to that. We get that all the time. Well, no, I mean past cases that. Uh, yeah, okay. Do I don't mind asking. Ask me about Bush versus Gore. I don't right. want to talk about Bush versus Gore. You've already answered it here. I, I don't but, either. But <laughs> <laughs> why why was judges have tenure, you're it for life. Why does yeah. everybody worry about 
things they say in public and not having cameras in the room and all that stuff. Why are you so sensitive about that? I'm sensitive about it because uh, uh, judges ought judges ought to express their views on the law in their opinions. Everything I had to say about the real legal issues in in Bush versus Gore was set forth in in the opinion that I joined. Um, beyond that, uh, I'm, I'm just either repeating myself or or adding things that really were not the basis for my uh, for my decision. And and I also don't like drawing the courts into the political maelstrom uh, uh, by you know having their uh, opinions uh, repeatedly uh, pawed over, uh, especially the controversial ones. Why not, though? I mean, that's democracy, isn't it? Well, I, I don't mind the people pawing over them <laughs> between themselves, but I don't think it's the role of the judge to uh, uh, give an account of himself to the people. You know, it's the tradition of, uh, of common law judges not to reply to press criticism. You know, we, we get clobbered by the press all the time. I can't tell you how many wonderful letters I've written to the Washington Post <laughs> just just for my own satisfaction and then ripped up and throw, thrown away. You don't send them. You don't send them. That's, that's the tradition of the common law judge. You do not respond to criticism. So why? Why is that? It's, it's because what the judge has to say is in the judge's opinion. Your biographer, I know you didn't choose, there, but Joan Biskupic and David Savage and others sat around at the end of the term and talked about you. Here's Joan Biskupic talking about you at the end of this last term. At the end of his very first term, the 80, uh, in 86, October 86 term, uh, in 87, uh, for Morrison v. Olson, nine minutes of him complaining about where the court had gone on the uh, mm. independent counsel statute. Uh, other memorable Scalia defense, uh, Romer v. Evans, the gay rights case out of Colorado. Uh, he, uh, he does have one just about every term. And uh, it's, uh, they're always vintage, and it was, it was, Interesting, though, the idea that he would go outside the record and complain about President Obama's order on um, young people who had brought, been brought here with their, their parents uh, illegally and un, are undocumented. And he did get a lot, of, a lot of really negative press on it. In fact, I think a couple people even suggested he should step down. But frankly, I think uh, he will still be doing what he does. She's right about that. You will be doing what you do, but what about the... <laughs> Can you explain? What's this going outside the record stuff? Uh, that was at we the, at have innumerable cases in which we cite newspaper articles. Innumerable cases. There's there's no rule that you cannot cite any public materials in in opinions, and only cite the record. I mean, if if it's a factual matter that 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 is up for decision, of course you can only use. Th the matters set forth in the record to determine the facts, but that's that's not the purpose for which I used it at all. And 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 we use the public records all the time. The point I was making there had nothing to do with a factual determination. Now, I don't want to. People should read the opinion to see whether my my use of of uh, that so-called non-record material was uh, was proper or not. Were you surprised at the reaction after you mentioned uh, President Obama in, in your remarks at the, on, at the, on the dais, the last decision on the Arizona decision, when E.J. Dion said you ought to resign? Who? <laughs> Columnist for the Washington Post. Oh, oh I, don't, I don't know that. Uh, no, I, I was, uh, I was uh, surprised that anyone would have, would have thought that the purpose for which I used the uh, the president's statement and and did not criticize the president's statement. In fact, I said it might be right. Uh, but the only point I made from it was, well, the attorney general had argued before us that the only reason the government wasn't enforcing uh, the immigration laws more rigorously was simply uh, enforcement priorities. It didn't have enough money. It had to it had to. Uh, decide who goes first and whatnot, and and uh, the the point I made was well. 
Even if that was true, uh, in my view, a sovereign state ought to be able to supplement the inadequate enforcement uh, funds with its own funds if it wants to. And then I added, moreover, it has since come to light that the, that the problem is not just an inadequacy of enforcement funds, but rather simply the unwillingness, perhaps for good reasons, of the uh, government to enforce the law. And for that purpose, I, I cited the, uh, the president's statement, which seemed to me perfectly fair. I did not say the president's statement was wrong. I just said that what the attorney general had told us concerning uh, enforcement priorities was simply, as the public record shows, not, uh, uh, not the sole problem. I'm going to go back to your book at page 356 and read you a sentence and have you explain it to we non-lawyers. Us. I, I knew you were going to do that. And I do I it all the time. That's fair. It's fair. It's I fair. caught it it's just. <laughs> the teachers will never forgive me. <laughs> all right. Textualists, I should take this slow. Yeah. Textualists should object to being called strict constructionist. Whether they know it or not, that is an irretrievably pejorativist. Is, is that correct, English? Pe that I, is I think I think that people it, tell me that pejorative is the proper pronunciation, but wow. I, I say pejorative. So. Whether they know it or not, this is I, I just read that. Um, yeah. As it ought to be. Strict constructional constructionism, as opposed to fair reading textualism, is not a doctrine to be taken seriously. And then you consider cases like to lay hands on a priest, which... Uh, right. Right. Would you like to explain that? <laughs> well, there was an old <laughs> statute that made it a crime to lay hands on a priest. And uh, d d does that mean, you know, if, if you shake hands or, or pat him on the shoulder? Of course not. It, uh, uh, the word is used colloquially to mean violent, uh, uh, violent attack upon a priest and a lot of other things. I mean, the, the First Amendment, for example, if, if, if you are a strict constructionist, uh, you would say that the First Amendment does not prohibit Congress from uh, censoring uh, handwritten letters because, after all, it, it only protects freedom of speech and of the press. And a handwritten letter is neither speech nor the press. But, of course, that's not the that's not the understood meaning of the First Amendment. It, it protects uh, freedom of expression. And those two are just the most common modes of can, expression. Can you give us an, uh, a layman's uh, definition of textualist? Uh, a textualist is someone who believes that the uh, uh, meaning of a statute is to be derived exclusively, exclusively from the text enacted by Congress and signed by the president or else uh, uh, repassed over his veto. The text is the sole source uh, that the judge ought to be using in, in making his judgment. You, um, the last part of this book is 13 falsities exposed. Yeah. The first one is the false notion that the spirit of a statute should prevail over its letter. Yeah. And are you exposing this falsity? Is this your idea of a falsity? Or is this what is taught in law schools? Oh, there, well, I mean, there, it's, it, it is said in some Supreme Court opinions that, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, the letter of the, uh, of the law is, uh, is contrary to its spirit and its spirit must, be, must prevail. That's nonsense. Uh, the letter of the law is the letter of the law. That's what we're governed by. We're not governed by some judicial uh, determination of spirit, uh, which, which could be anything. Um, but the, the, the statement comes up awful, uh, often. It is an empowerment of judges. Judges can simply say, oh, yes, the text says that, but that's contrary to the spirit of the law, and we're going to go ahead and do whatever we like. I mean, that, that's just not, uh, not democratic self-government if people can't have their representatives write a statute which is to be applied as written. Uh, the 62nd of your 
headings. I don't know. How, what do you call them? Each one of those, every time you make a point that this is the 60 second. Know. Numbers, we call them. So it's easy. <laughs> okay. Touche. Uh, here's the 60 second. It's got all kinds of things on this page I want to ask you about. The false notion that words should be strictly construed. That's the 60 second. Right. And the th third or fourth. Right. Falsely. Well, that's what we just talked about. Strict construction. You don't want to construe it strictly. You want to construe it reasonably. You don't want to construe it strictly. You don't want to construe it sloppily. You want to go right down the middle, construe it reasonably. What would the ordinary reader of English interpret this statement to mean? Uh, unless it's obviously being used in a technical sense. I mean, there's some, you know, technical expressions in various areas of the law. The, uh, the other things on that page I want to ask you about is uh, one of them, as you mentioned, uh, one of the justices often in the book, Joseph's story. And Joseph's story, as you know, was the youngest justice ever. Youngest ever. He also has another thing in common with you. He had seven children. Yeah, that's pretty good. And you've had nine. nine. I should ask you at this point, as I yeah. did last time, you had 28 grandchildren. If right. you could name them all and you were offended by that. I, I continue to be offended. I think that's a... An unfair. But, but now you have 34. 33. Oh, 34. 34 is an unreasonable number of grandchildren. <laughs> and, and did you bring the list with you? I did not bring the list with you. You give me enough time, I'll come up with all of them, Brian. <laughs> a Joseph's story, though, years yeah. and years ago, back in the early 1800s, uh, he was there 33 years. Why so much of him in the book? What do you think of him? Oh, he was one of the greats. He wrote the first commentary on the Constitution of the United States. Uh, while while he was a, a sitting uh, a sitting justice, he was a professor at Harvard Law School, uh, a, a great intellectual, one one, one of the uh, leading intellectuals, maybe the leading intellectual on the on the early court. And he also published. He taught school. Uh, oh yeah, and, taught at Harvard. And published books the whole time. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You know, ju judges. Uh, have always been part of the intellectual life of the country. You know, unlike in Europe, where judges are sort of, uh, you know, bureaucrats uh, in, in, in the ordinary courts. But at least in the most, in the more important courts, uh, judges in our common law system have always been part of the intellectual discourse. Uh, even in the court of appeals levels, people like Henry Friendly and Learned Hand and so forth. We had you here in 2000. It's not here. Uh, but in 2006, we had our cameras in front of you and Justice Breyer. Um, I want to show you this, uh, talking about judges. Yeah. You're going to see, did the good guy win, did the bad guy win? And you're inclined to say, if the good guy won, wonderful judges. And if the bad guy won, terrible judges. That's not true. Unless you believe that every statute ever written produces a sensible result. But, you know, the, 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 the ideal rule for, for the honest judge is garbage in, garbage out. You are supposed to interpret the statutes reasonably, even if you don't agree with the result, because it's not up to you to decide what's garbage. And if you bear that in mind, you, you, you should be, you should be uh, what should I say, uh, more careful uh, to either praise or criticize judges just because you like the outcome or dislike the outcome of their cases. You said some of that earlier, but garbage in, garbage out. Um, you've said colorful things over the years. Yeah, it's pretty colorful. Do you know that when you're on the bench and you do that? I mean, is that something that you do on purpose? No, I don't do it much on the bench. I do it in my opinions sometimes. I think they make the, the opinions more readable, more lively, which is a good thing, especially dissents, because there's really no reason to read a dissent. I mean, <laughs> the dissent is the losing side. If, if you're a lawyer, you want to know what... What rule to follow? You read the majority opinion. The dissents, uh, I don't know, you, you write the dissents, uh, I write them uh, mainly for, for, for the law students because uh, um, the dissent will be published in our system. The, uh, the law professors, even when they disagree with the dissent, have to present uh, both sides of the case so that there can be lively discussion of it in class. So they'll publish my dissent and uh, I like to make the dissent clear and uh, readable and uh, even interesting, and even funny sometimes. How much of you impact have you had on the oral arguments? <clears throat> on oral arguments? I mean, they're not what they were years no, ago. No, they're not what they were. When, when I first came on the court, um, 
Very few questions were asked. I, I argued before the court once before I became a judge, and I got only two questions. I think it was two, maybe three, from all of them from Byron White in, in the whole time I argued. Uh, nowadays, uh, wow, the, the whole process consists of responding to questions from the court. Um, I think the latter is, is better. Did you start it? I, th I was the first one who started asking a lot of questions, I guess. And that was probably my, my law school background, my law professor background. And then when other law, former law professors came on the court, they continued the same. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, of course, another former law professor. Uh, Stephen Breyer, another former law professor. Here is an oral argument. We have it on audio from 1999. You're asking the questions. The other voice you hear is, see if you recognize it, is someone who is making a presentation before the court. And unless it is itself a recipient of federal financial assistance, it's not covered by Title IX. Now, this is it's I, not I, I, don't, a, I don't quite see how the university gets, uh, gets stuck here. Uh, as far as the university is concerned, it, pursuant to the rules, has denied a waiver in circumstances where denial would be perfectly appropriate. As far as what the university has done, the university hasn't discriminated at all. Well, if the university is... The, the only thing that makes the waiver, the denial of the waiver bad is that this other organization has granted waivers in other universities in other contexts. Uh, how, how do you pin this on the, on the university? Because the university is the entity that is operating the covered program or activity. Recognize that voice? Um, Don't recognize it, no. He was before the court, uh, what, some like 30 times before he Oh, yeah. Was it Roberts? Chief is that, Justice. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how often is that? You said you were one time before the court, before you sat right, in the court. Right, right. And I noticed that, uh, was Paul Clement one of your He was a uh, former clerks? law clerk, right. So he steps up in, in the, in the uh, uh, health care case. That's right. A lot of other cases. You know, he's a former solicitor general, and the former solicitors general uh, uh, are, are part of the, um, uh, what you might call the, um, uh, the Supreme Court uh, bar, the, 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 the regularly appearing Supreme Court bar. As you know, after the health care case and Chief Justice Roberts' position on it, a lot of copy written about the personal antagonism between members of the court. I know you answered this the other night, but if you would talk a little more about your perception. First of all, was there a leak that came out of the court on that story? I wouldn't. You wouldn't what? I wouldn't talk about it. You did, though. What? You said you, you and the justice, uh, Chief I, Justice. I responded to a very precise question of whether, you know, there were slamming doors and whatnot, and that's, you know, that's absolute nonsense. But are there, are there personal feelings behind the scenes I, on all I this stuff? I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> are there... Let me do this. Oh, the question you were talking about, I mean, the answer you were talking about earlier about what you write in your opinions. Has there ever been in your past when you make some strong statements, personal, you know, fallout from that? You know, I, I'm, you know I've criticized the opinions of some of my colleagues and uh, we have remained friends. Just as they have criticized uh, my opinions and we have remained friends. Look, at it, 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 this is a kind of a job if, if you can't disagree, even disagree vehemently on the law without taking it personally and without, uh, uh, you know, hating the person who's on the other side, you ought to find another job. That, so, you know, that's it. Done. Done. <laughs> Why do you uh, sometimes have... I mean, anybody that knows you knows you are a jolly fellow. I'm a jolly fellow. Yeah, but why is it you take such an intense, you know, when you're dealing with this subject, you look like you're mad? With what subject? This whole business of the law. I mean, you look like you're... you're well, uh, I shouldn't look mad. Why should I look jolly when I talk about a very serious, heartfelt uh, issue? One in which what used to be... The, the stuff we set forth in this book, is orthodoxy. It was the traditional approach to judging until about the middle of the 20th century. 
we are trying to bring that back. It's a, it's a very significant uh, issue of how judges go about uh, giving effect to democratically enacted legislation and to the democratically ratified Constitution. It's a s terribly important matter. You want me to smile and look, look jolly when I'm talking about that? I don't know. I, 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 I think I should look impassioned when I talk about it because I do care passionately about it. What makes I'm, not, you, I'm not angry, I'm what, just impassioned. What, what makes you mad? What makes me in, in mad? In dealing with the law and dealing with the court and dealing with lawyers that come before you, issues, the press. Well, yeah, the press gets, well, if you read it, it gets under your skin. I don't, don't much read it, but uh, uh, you get used to it. You get used to the fact that you can't respond, so they can say anything at all. That's why all these leaked stuff, you know, that, yeah. We don't respond. So effectively, they can say whatever they want. Say whatever you like. We're not, we're not going to respond to it. Near the end of your book, you write, when however living constitutionalists read a prohibition of the death penalty into the Constitution and no fewer than four Supreme Court justices who served during the tenure of your judicial co-author, which is you, would have done so, all flexibility is at an end. At, at an end. It would thereafter be of no use debating the merits of the death penalty, just as it is of no use debating the merits of prohibiting abortion. Right. You stepped on two big issues there, right? Yeah, now what you're talking about there is, is the other big theoretical uh, issue raised by the book. One is textualism, we've talked about that. The second is originalism. And what that says is that the text ought to be given the meaning it had when it was adopted, when it was enacted, or when it was ratified in the case of the Constitution. Thus, the words uh, cruel and unusual punishments in the Eighth Amendment should be given the meaning they were understood to have by the American people who ratified it. And it was clear that when that Eighth Amendment was ratified, the death penalty was not considered to be prohibited. Indeed, the death penalty existed in all the states and was the only penalty for a felony. So for somebody today to say that somehow the American people have prohibited the states by ratifying the Constitution, they have prohibited the states from applying the death penalty, I don't know where this comes from. The American people never voted for any such thing. That's what originalism is. What did this mean when the American people uh, uh, ratified it? Now, there are some phenomena, you know, the death penalty was a phenomenon that existed at the time. There are other phenomena that didn't exist at the time. And for those, you, you, you can't say what was the original meaning, like when the electric chair comes in. You have to decide whether that is cruel and unusual punishment. Okay? But you're your starting point, your base point, against which you compare these later phenomena, is what was extant and what was approved at the time the Eighth Amendment was ratified. And so if the electric chair is less cruel than hanging, which it certainly is, it's not prohibited by the Eighth Amendment. Likewise, uh, death by injection, which is even less cruel than the electric chair and certainly less cruel than hanging. That's what originalism is all about. Here's another one of your 13 falsities exposed. By the way, who, um, who wrote that? We made them up. What? Who, who wrote that headline, 13 falsities that, exposed? That, that, that was your, your namesake, spelled differently, Brian. Yeah. Brian, the co-author of this The co-author. Brian right. Garner, yeah. who's at SMU? No, he's not a law professor. He's he, not? He, he, um, he is um, probably the foremost lexicographer, especially lexicographer of law. He's the editor of Black's Law Dictionary. He has a number of books on legal usage and uh, highly, highly respected scholar. Uh, has his own company called Law Pros, lectures about the country on, on uh, uh, writing briefs and on uh, oral argument. Just so uh, um, 
I have to read the last line here of his bio. It says he's also a distinguished research professor of law at Southern Methodist University. Yeah, but he's an adjunct. I mean, he's, I, I don't think he's a full-time faculty. All right, here, here's one of the falsities exposed. Yeah. The false notion that lawyers and judges, not being historians, are unqualified to do the historical research that originalism requires. Right. I, I mean, that is false. Some people say, you know, what, what are you, Scalia, historian? You're going to figure out what this meant in, in 1791 when the Bill of Rights was ratified. Uh, yeah, I can do that just as I can decide patent cases. What do I know about uh, patents? I know nothing. But I listen to, to each side. They bring that, That's what the adversarial system is all about. Each side has an interest in bringing forward the best evidence possible. So just as I can decide a patent case by, by evaluating, in, in fact, it's even easier for me to evaluate historical evidence than it is uh, patent evidence for Pete's sake. Uh, judges do this all the time. And uh, it, it's, it's the counsel who have to be expert or who have to know where to point the judges for expert advice. And I, uh, I don't see why judges uh, cannot cannot do history. They have to do history all the time. You write, there is no historical support whatever for the proposition that any provision in the Constitution guaranteed a right to abortion or to sodomy or to assisted suicide. These acts were criminal in all states for two centuries. Right. So if you're an originalist, it's, it's, it's a silly question to answer whether it's unconstitutional to prohibit them. It obviously wasn't when whatever provision of the Constitution you're relying on was adopted. And it's, it's, it doesn't mean you have to prohibit them, just as it doesn't mean you, you have to have the death penalty. These are, these are political questions for the, for the American people to decide. That's what democracy is about. You think, you think abortion uh, 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 should not be prohibited? Fine. Persuade your fellow citizens. Pass a law. Uh, you think the opposite? Persuade them the other way. But don't tell me that the Constitution has, has taken that issue out of democratic choice. It simply hasn't. And it's the same for those other issues. I, you know, death penalty, abortion, uh, sodomy, whatever. Put it, persuade your fellow citizens and go either way. Another historical figure that you quote a lot in your book is Jeremy Bentham. Right. Who is he? Well, an English uh, philosopher who had a lot to say about law as well. Why should you follow him? He's a very smart fella. <laughs> He's been dead a number of years. <laughs> he has, but so has Aristotle. <laughs> 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 but he, he also was, was, was highly respected by the framers of our Constitution and has been influential uh, on legal theory uh, ever since. Don't I remember you disagreeing in a public forum that we covered about citing foreign law? And, and you, you mentioned a lot of foreign... Uh, experts, a lot of British, of course, who we get a lot of our law in here. Yes, I see. I don't consider English law foreign law. English law, uh, to the extent it, it informs the meaning of the Constitution. For example, what does due process of law mean? That phrase in the Constitution. I mean, in the abstract, it could mean anything. It means something different to a 12th century Frenchman than it does to a, a 16th century Hawaiian. Its meaning in our Constitution is the meaning that was given it by 18th century Englishmen. And that's why English law is very relevant to, uh, to our Constitution and to American law. French law is not. Italian law is not. And you're an Italian. And even, oh, well, I'm, Italian. I mean, I'm an American, but, but of I mean, Italian descent. Father and mother. Were both your parents Italian? Both. Well, my mother was born, no, she was American, but yeah. born... Uh, uh, of an Italian immigrant family. Here is another thing I want you to discuss. That uh, this is your; these are your words. By the way, how, how did you both write this? Who wrote what? I, you know, if my life depended on telling you, some passages I, I recall are mine. Some I recall are his, but most of them they 
they have become so melded. Uh, he worked on mine, I worked on his. Uh, the end product is is the product that. But how did us. you do it? I mean, physically, he's not here in town, so. No, he told me, uh, you know, said, let's let's divvy up these uh, these canons of interpretation. You work on this one, this one, this one. I'll work on the other ones, and we did that. And then, you know, I I sent him my my take on the ones I was assigned, and and he sent me his on the ones he was assigned. And we went back and forth and back and forth. This thing took three and a half years to do. It was, well, uh, you're, this is probably a fair way to say it, but you're a not notorious word nitpicker. Yeah, but so was he. That's what I wanted to ask. Oh, God, was, yes. Oh, yeah. He's he a, worse than you? He's a snoot. He's at least as bad as I am. At least as bad. Probably worse. Probably worse. You he guys knows, ever come to blows? No. No, but he knows stuff about words. I mean, I don't know why you would want all that em empty information in your head. For example, one time I, 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 I complained, I said, Brian, you know, people always refer to it as duct tape. It's not duct tape, it's duct tape with a T. And he said, you know, that's wrong, that <laughs> it was originally devised for the military. It was, I think he said, a olive drab color, and it was called duct tape. Only later did it come to be used for air conditioning. Now, now, who would want to have that kind of information? Only only a word nut. And Brian is a word nut. But he got you, though. He got me. Got me. All right, let me, let me read this to you. The modern Congress sails close to the wind all the time. Federal statutes today often all but acknowledge their questionable constitutionality with provisions for accelerated judicial review for standing on the for standing on the part of the members of Congress and even for fallback dispositions should the primary disposition be held unconstitutional. Right. But I want to go back to that original thing, statement. The modern Congress sails close to the wind all the time. Yeah, that, that followed upon um, uh, our statement that uh, you know, traditionally uh, uh, Congress is, uh, you, you assume the constitutionality of any statute that Congress enacts because it is assumed that Congress would not, uh, in, in, indeed, if there is even constitutional uh, doubt, you, you give the Congress the benefit of the doubt. In recent years, however, it, it, it's more questionable whether Congress is really even thinking about the constitutionality, and, and that passage recites the fact that this is evident from the content of their statutes. I mean, who would have ever thought in the, in the 19th century, for example, that Congress would pass a statute which says, in the event the stuff we've just said is unconstitutional, we have this other provision instead, which is what Congress has done. I mean, that, that, that makes you wonder, you know, are they really sure this stuff is constitutional? Have they really thought about it? Um, and I think that comment was also, um, made in response to uh, the charge uh, of, of, quote, judicial activism, which is a word that doesn't mean anything, really. It just means <laughs> that the person who uses it doesn't agree with the decision. I mean, what is judicial activism? It is certainly not doing actively what judges ought to do. Is that judicial activism? I think not. And if a statute ought to be held unconstitutional, it's not judicial activism to call it unconstitutional. Number 44, artificial person canon. Right. Now, I wrote down beside that, even though you didn't, Citizens United. Um, that's another one that's created a storm. Uh, well, well, person isn't used in the First Amendment. I mean, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. Or but what, what is your, maybe you don't even want to touch this, but what is your, as a person, do you worry at all? I know you don't, well, as a person, do you worry at all that there's too much money in politics? No, you know, I really don't. I, I forget what the figures are, but I think we spend less on our presidential campaigns each year when there's a presidential election, then, uh, then the country spends on cosmetics. I mean, well, but, but what about the unusual amount of this, influence? About, you know, people are worried that the corporations now can buy. I think this is a real uh, conduit. If, if you believe that, you, you, we ought to go back to monarchy, that the people are such sheep 
that they just swallow whatever, whatever they see on television or read in the newspapers? No, the premise of democracy is that people are intelligent and can discern the true, the true from the false, at least when, when as the, the campaign laws require, you know who is speaking. You can't speak anonymously. You, you, have, to, you have to say, uh, you know, identify the people that are But we don't know who's speaking in, in right now. You know the organization that's speaking. Not necessarily. I mean, you know they don't have to, in, in, you know, don't need to go into the details, but in some of this way this money is being raised, you know, we will never know. You will, may not know who contributes to the organization. You know the organization that's speaking. So that's all you need to know. You don't need to know that they're hiding behind their... Well, the press can find out, uh, you know, who's hiding behind what. But that's... That's not hard, or you can tell from... The... Anyway, look, at the, the premise is freedom of speech. The more speech, the better. I, I cannot understand why... Uh, well, and as far as Citizens United... Don't, don't forget, Citizens United was not novel. It reversed an opinion eight years earlier that had changed the law from what the law had been in, in Buckley versus Vallejo. That was assumed to be the law. All so, right, we, we're about out of time. And I've we never are asked, about out I've of time. I've never asked you this on the camera, but I'm going to do it now okay. because I need to get the latest thinking on your okay. part. Okay. Television in the court. Television in the court. And the reason I bring it up is the Congress yeah, yeah, yeah. has fool with resolutions. I remember passed it, yeah, yeah. ordering the court to go on television. Why are you so against it? Um, Brian, I, I was um, for it when I first joined the court and, uh, and, and switched and, and remain on that side of it. I am against it because I do not believe, as the proponents of television in the court assert, that the purpose of, of uh, televising our hearings would be to educate the American people. That's not what, what, what it would end up doing. If I really thought it would educate the American people, I would be all for it. If the American people sat down and watched our proceedings gavel to gavel, they would never again ask, as I'm sometimes asked, yeah, Justice Glee, why do you have to be a, uh, a lawyer to be on the Supreme Court? The Constitution doesn't say No, the Constitution doesn't say so. But if you know what our real business is, if you know that we're not usually contemplating our navel, should there be a right to this or that, should there be a right to abortion, should there be a right to homos, that's not usually what we're doing. We're usually dealing with the Internal Revenue Code, with ERISA, which all, with, with patent law, with all sorts of dull stuff that only a lawyer could, uh, could understand uh, and, and perhaps get interested in. If the American people saw all of that, they would be educated. But they wouldn't see all of that. But you, we get your, your outfit would carry it yeah, all, we get to the, be sure. But what most of the American people would see would be 30-second, 15-second takeouts from our argument, and those takeouts would not be characteristic of what we do. They would be uncharacteristic. Yeah, now but what we see is an article in a newspaper that's out of context with what you say is... Uh, that's fine, but it's... it's, it's you, people read that and they say, well, it's an art article in a newspaper, and the guy may be lying, or he may be misinformed. But somehow when you see it live, a, a, an excerpt pulled out of an entire... When you see it live, it has a much greater impact. No, it... We, it I am sure it will miseducate the American people, not educate. Well, we get the audio. We get the audio at the end of the week. Yeah, but the audio is not is not of interest to the 15-second takeout people and the 30-second takeout people. The audio yeah, isn't but what of the interest. The First Amendment precisely say because 50, it doesn't have that kind of impact. But the First Amendment doesn't go well. Takeouts are not good. We can't have those 15-second sound bites. The First Amendment has nothing to do with whether we have to televise our proceedings. But aren't you an advocate? You're, you're yeah. saying the First Amendment requires us to no, televise our proceedings? No, I just said that you're a big advocate of the First Amendment. I am indeed. And it doesn't require us to televise our proceedings. All right, last question. <laughs> do you still like you this? You've got to be logical, Brian. Of course. Uh, do yeah. you like this job and do you ever intend on retiring? Oh, I, I, I'm sure I will retire someday. And it, you know, it's, it doesn't. Job doesn't last for it. It's only a lifetime job, is all. <laughs> is there a, what, what will be the trigger for you? And the did you think you'd stay this long? No, I didn't. I didn't. I, I thought I'd get out uh, 
as soon as I could retire at, at full, full pension. And, you know, I've been working for nothing for, I guess, over 10 years. I could have retired You're at eight. You're still paid, though. Yeah, I'm still paid, but I would get paid just as much if I retired. What I, is it, 15 I years? My, and yeah, whatever it was. Over I could 70? have retired when I was, when I was 65. I could have retired. So I'm probably too stupid to have this job at this point. But I don't know what else I'd do. When will I retire? I will, I will certainly retire, absolutely retire, at the time where I perceive that I am not as good as I used to be, that I've, I've lost a step. I don't want the product of my uh, judicial career to be uh, um, demeaned by uh, inadequate uh, performance later on. Have as soon asked, as I think I've lost a step, I'll, I'll get have out. Have you asked anybody to tell you when they think you've lost a no, step? I'll know when I've lost a step. And, no, I have not many, yet. and I have many friends and enemies who, who will certainly tell me. The name of the book is Reading yeah. Law, colon, The Interpretation of Legal Texts by Antonin Scalia and Brian A. Garner. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Brian. Enjoy it. For a DVD copy of this program, call 1-877-662-7726. For free transcripts, or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at qna.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts.